So once again, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, the honest truth is that you really honor me. Thank you. I know it's Friday night. I know there are lots of other options in London and lots of other talks about Iran on mm -hmm. um, this very night. So I can't express my gratitude enough. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> With your permission, what I'll do, I'll just take a couple of minutes uh, for those who were not here last night um, to wrap up what we talked about last night. Uh, and then I stopped, like my great-grandmother Shahirzad, at a very um, important moment. And I will then pick up at that very moment and go on. Uh, although I have to say, I wish I had the talent of Shahrzad. Um, so we talked about um, the life uh, of Furuk Farukhzad a little bit. Um, I think perhaps the new um, revelation, at least for me, as someone who has worked on Furuk Farukhzad, I submitted my dissertation at the University of California in Los Angeles in 1979. And it was on Furuk Farah Saad. In 1977, I was ABD, which meant I was done with my coursework, and I started going to Iran to interview. And so this has been a long process um, for me. It is not the only project I have worked on, of course. So it has been off and on working on Furukh Farukhzad, but she has been my companion. You know, I have often said that um, after I left Iran, Persian poetry, but in particular Furukh Farukhzad's poetry, became my evergreen garden. Its doors were always open to me, and I always found shelter and refuge in that exquisite garden of hers. I believe Furu Farosad has desegregated the pantheon of Persian poetry. It's hard to talk about Iran and the glorious tradition of Iranian poetry and to only name Hafez, Ferdowsi, Saadi, uh, and a few others, and not to mention Furu Farosad. Khanum Zandian, a, a fantastic writer in her own right, um, called me just a day before I left for London. And um, she was talking about the book and something she told me that I didn't know. She said, you know, there are bookstores, lots of bookstores in Tehran, Jeles, in Los Angeles. And um, the owner <coughs> of uh, the biggest bookstore had told her that to this day, there are two categories of books we sell the most. Hafez poetries, the poetry of Hafez, and the poetry of Furu Farahzad. Now, this is not a scientific sample, obviously, but we know from the reprints of her books inside the country that Furu Farahzad has become an industry. I mean, the number of books, articles, uh, films, uh, voice recording made on her has turned her into definitely one of the most talked about Iranian women. <coughs> Not only in literature, but in our culture, in our, in our history, I may dare say. So um, the other major thing I think that I said is that by the end of finishing my biography, I thought a lot about what is the most important revelation. And um, to put it simply, which is always a dangerous thing to do, uh, is that I believe this poet suffered a lot more uh, than we have been led to believe. Uh, that uh, I believe she had a traumatic youth, uh, which had an impact on her for the rest of her life. Uh, we talked a little bit, and I read the whole poem, Daryoft, uh, that I have translated as Epiphany. 
uh, a few of my colleagues have translated it as insight, which is also a great uh, poem. In case you have not read that poem, may I suggest that you please read it and read it carefully. It's in her collection, Tavalludi Digar, the, third, the, four, uh, the fourth poetry collection. So we, we talked about uh, her introduction to the Iranian literary scene, which was through her poem, Sin. We talked a little bit about Sin. Again, uh, we know everything that is amazing about that poem. But I said what I find fascinating in that poem is that Farooq, who was a warrior for freedom, never wanted freedom without responsibility. And that, in our country, um, is a very important thing. Our experience with modernity, with the role of the individual, with the responsibility that comes with the right granted to an individual has not been quite recognized yet. And today I will go back and talk a little bit about this subject and this topic. So the three themes that will be the center of my conversation today with you uh, will be the continuation of the fact that Furu Farouk told the truth. She thought that was an obligation. And remember, for thousands of years, starting with Zardosht, we've been t told Goftarenik. So telling the truth has been a problem, has been a concern in our culture. And Farooq, from early youth, from the, one of the first poems she wrote, she said, I will tell the truth. But she went further, and I love that. She said, if telling the truth is my obligation, hearing the truth is my right. And imagine uh, the significance of that, that you expect to hear the truth. And what will happen if you don't hear the truth? That's one. The second one is what we just discussed, that freedom is the right of a modern citizen, freedom of expression, freedom of all these various, to own her body, uh, to own her sexuality, to choose her lover, uh, to choose her husband, uh, to choose to divorce, all of these. But more importantly, that with that freedom comes a lot of responsibility. And the third one, which will be the focus of my talk mainly today, is the freedom of movement. And I will get to that after I finish the leftover from last night and only focus on freedom of movement, which will help us um, place Farooq Farooq Zad in a global context. Farooq is no longer only an Iranian poet. Uh, she has made it. She has been translated more than any other Iranian poet of the modern era. And there is a reason for it. She talks to people globally. She, she has an audience that is interested in what she has to say. So let me go back to where we stopped last night. Um, we said that after the poem, uh, Sin was published, um, there was, like always, anything associated with Furuk Farah Saad has a lot of controversy attached to it. Um, and we know why. There, there are always those who vehemently oppose her and those who passionately love her and support her. And it really represents the two Irans, the paradox of Iran. Uh, Farooq Farooq Zad is a perfect metaphor for what has happened to our country in the last 100, 150 years. She, she is the distilled manifestation of that bipolar, divided country. 
So there were lots of people who loved the poem. There were lots who were really angry. Um, we talked about how just about a year later, Furuk published Asir, her first poetry collection, and the book was very successful. But very soon after that short-lived success, <coughs> a serial began to be published in that exact same magazine that had published Asir, um, the magazine Roshan Fegr. The editor-in-chief was um, Mr. Nasser Khodayar, a writer, a translator, a major figure uh, in the 50s and 60s in Iran. As you see, if you might remember the pictures I showed you about the poem Sin, there is great resemblance between this woman and the picture that um, was right next to Furur's poem. And this is a serial fiction. It's a, you know, Pavaraki. That was very popular in, in the 60s and 50s in Iran. And it was about the love affair of a, of a man with a woman who was a painter, not a poet, but who shared many of the characteristic features of Furul Farrakh. So some of the lines from the poem uh, sin are in fact in this um, short story, this serialized story. Um, this is Farooq signing uh, her book at an early age. This is before she had her nose surgery. Farooq uh, did do a nose surgery. Um, and uh, here's another one, um, young Farooq. And then here's just a few months later. You see how emaciated she is? This is because Farooq was very upset about, at the time she was a married woman with a child, and she lived um, in a household that um, Iranian, to be f fair, at, uh, at the time, who really concerned about the honor of their women. Uh, and here was a serialized uh, fiction, uh, but talking about the details of her extramarital relationship, uh, Farooq had a nervous breakdown. She sent Feridun Farrakhzad, uh, who told me himself that he went to Nasser Khodayar, and a close friend of hers, uh, Parvine Moazed, a lovely woman who has also helped me a great deal with this um, biography. Um, Mr. Um, um, Nasser Khodayar sent him a message um, and he told me, I have also interviewed him, uh, he told me, uh, I sent Farooq a message I said, I'm the one who took you up with the publication of Sin, and now I'm going to make sure to bring you down. And, um, so Farooq had a nervous breakdown. Uh, the father was very upset. Uh, she was kicked out of her parental house. Um, the husband, as you can understand, was also upset. Um, and um, Farooq was hospitalized in Reza'i um, hospital, mental hospital. Uh, we know she was given electric shock therapy. Uh, and you know, at the time, electric shock therapy were given without the administration of anesthesia. Uh, Sylvia Platt, my dear friend, referred to um, Sylvia Platt. Sylvia Platt in Bell Jar has one of the most amazing description of um, electric shock therapy uh, in that early phase of it that uh, uh, was, as I said, was administered without um, anesthesia. Uh, and recently, uh, in more than a decade ago maybe, Shiva uh, Arastui, in a wonderful book called Afyun, 
uh, has another reference uh, to the shock, the, uh, the agony, the pain of electric shock therapy. So uh, Farrokhzad uh, was there she, when she came out. The, the rumor around her was unbearable. Um, she uh, divorced her husband. Um, and we know that eventually she would lose the custody of her one and only biological child. And I will talk about the details of that in the last talk when I talk about how Furugh revived the very definition of family in Iran. Um, uh, to help herself and uh, to get away from it all, uh, to regain her health, physical and mental, she decided to leave the country. And uh, soon I will talk about the details of uh, that trip with you. Um, she was away for um, 14 months. Uh, at the beginning, she went to Italy. She had a very close friend, a wonderful painter, Behjat Sadr, who was also her teacher, painting teacher um, in Europe. Um, and Behjat Sadr was a close friend of Farah Zad and had an impact on her life. Um, and um, after about seven months, she went to Germany to be with her brother. Uh, the, the story of uh, the days in Germany, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Uh, but uh, finally, at um, 14 months, she decided that uh, she just needed to be back in her own country. Uh, and uh, she went back to Iran. She uh, drove back um, with the car uh, from Germany uh, to Iran. Well, she uh, needed to uh, be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, she needed to earn a living. And uh, you know that Farooq uh, didn't even have her high school diploma. She had finished ninth grade of higher education, uh, uh, high school education. It wasn't that easy. And she started writing. That's the period when she started writing uh, under a pseudonym. Uh, her first pseudonym, which is fascinating, was the iconoclast. And uh, we'll talk about that too, um, how ironic it is that the woman uh, who, to the best of my knowledge, had only chosen two um, uh, pseudonyms. The first one was iconoclast and has herself turned into an icon. I mean, the most difficult task of a biographer of Farooq Farooq Saad, like, like me, since I'm talking today, was the right to demystify this myth. How do you talk about a myth? How do you humanize an icon? But anyway, so she started talking. She published her short stories. Farooq has published seven short stories. A couple of them with no name or only uh, the editor-in-chiefs knew that they're theirs because they're very autobiographical and, uh, and a few under her own name. But the money she made and with the publication of her third poetry collection, Rebellion, Essian, we know that in the land of the rose and the nightingale, in the country, we, we love poetry. Our poets, at least in the modern period, cannot live with the income of uh, their books and their pens. So she needed a job. She was introduced to Mr. Ebrahim Golestan uh, with two of their mutual uh, friends. And she was hired immediately uh, to be a filing clerk and a receptionist. At the time, Farooq Farooq Saad had already published three poetry collections, Asir, Divar, Osyan, Captive, Walls, and Rebellion. I repeat this to give you an idea of the struggles of a woman poet 
in the 50s, in the 60s, um, in Iran. She was delighted to get the job. She was hired with a salary of 852 months, which is a lot of money for the 1950s Iran. And that really changed her life. As you uh, remember, Virginia Woolf said, in order to become a writer, a woman needs a room of her own and economic independence, which will allow her the leisure, which, which will allow her the time to dedicate to writing, which is a full-time job. So, um, now there, Ebrahim Golestan, this is an older picture, at the time was 36, Farooq Farah Saad was 24. Uh, the employer and the employee <coughs> had many dissimilarities. One was a successful, well-to-do uh, artist. He had, at the time, the most um, technically advanced uh, film studio in the country. Uh, he was a short story writer. He had a political past. He was the editor-in-chief of one of the most important magazines of uh, the Tude Party, Organe Hezbe Tude, Dar Mazandaran. And he lived in a beautiful garden in Dar Rus at the time. Furu Farazad was 24 years old had already had a very difficult life, was living in a small apartment in Khyabane Muezzi. Um, as, as I said, could barely support herself and really didn't have the support of her family. Turan, uh, Turan Farahzad, her mother, always backed her up, always. And, and Turan Farrakhzad was a delightful woman. She suffered a lot. We talked about the suffering of Turan Farrakhzad. But she um, always supported Farooq. Her love was non-judgmental. Mm, didn't matter uh, what the daughter did. Didn't matter if it was right or wrong. She was the mother, the loving mother. And um, so um, she was a divorced woman. At that point in her life, she was even denied sporadic visitation rights with her one and only biological son. And I will come back to that in my fourth talk and the unfairness of this. And I don't blame the husband. But I feel great sorrow and sadness for the son and for the mother and for a culture that allows um, such unfairness I, um, uh, to mothers. Uh, Farooq, in effect, became an ex-mother. And I don't think any mother should ever become an ex-mother regardless. Um, so the um, relationship, um, the love relationship started a bit later and it uh, became um, one of the, as far as I have read and I'm familiar, I think they are the most beautiful love poetry written by a woman for a man. Um, I want to read, I had quite a few examples, but I won't have time to read them. Uh, I'm hoping you will uh, reread them. They're, they're truly, uh, you know, they make you want to fall in love again. Um, so let me just read one of them. Um, it's a poor translation of mine, and uh, definitely 
The Persian, trans the Persian original is exquisite. You come from far away places. You is Gulistan here, Mr. Gulistan, from the land of fragrance and light. And you know Farooq loved fragrance and light, uh, jasmine, flowers, uh, and so, uh, she, she was in love with the sun. You have set me on a bark built of ivory and clouds and crystals. Take me away, oh my dear love. Take me to the city of poetry and passion. Wash me in waves of wine. Wrap me in the velvet of your kisses. Call me to yourself in languorous nights. Leave me never. Part me not from the stars. Look how in my eyes sorrow melts away drop by drop. Look, see me touched by the sun. See me enveloped, fevered. See me awash in the light, lifted to the stars. Look, see me where I've reached. You call me and I go to the galaxies, to the infinite, to the eternal. So a lot has been said about this relationship. The poems are of course the most clearly um, taboo breaking. Farooq has entered a taboo territory in many of these poems. So the book also includes 15 of Farooqzad's poems. I'm sorry, 15 of her unpublished letters to Mr. Golestan. They have never been published. We've had sections, little sections of random letters. Um, uh, and I don't know, I haven't found all of them in these letters, a few of them, but not all of them. But these 15 letters are very similar to the poetry. But what will be fascinating to you if you read those poems. It's not only the passionate, lustful love of a woman for a man. It is the intellectual relationship. It is the way these two talked about films. Before reading these poems, I had no idea Farooq knew so much about films. You know, we uh, most of the uh, writing about the house is black has been about, well, as in one um, of his talk back in Iran in the 60s, Mr. Golestan said, did you just believe that Ms. Uh, Ms. Farrokhzad woke up one night and after putting some makeup on, decided that she's going to become uh, the director of this masterpiece? The house is black. Those letters will prove to you the level of knowledge that this woman had for, um, for films and the conversation. We don't have, unfortunately, Mr. Golestan's letters, but at least we have the letters she has written, constantly discussing techniques, contents, how wonderful this film is, how terrible the other one was. It is a revelation. It's going to help a lot of people who've been working on Farooq and cinema to understand her love of cinema better and to understand her techniques as well. So those letters, I'm going to read a couple of sections of a couple of them to you. Uh, and then start uh, going and uh, discussing the theme of tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, how much? Well, yeah, about half an hour. Half an hour, okay. So, um, in the 15 letters, Farooq uses Qurbanat Beravam, which I wasn't able to 
translate it properly in English. It's a difficult translation in English. So, you know, I would give all my life for you. I will die for you. You know, I didn't want to use the word sacrifice. It, it just, qurbanat beravam. You know, I've seen it translated uh, as, may I sacrifice myself for you. It just doesn't relay the beauty um, and the elegance of the Persian. Um, so I've decided to leave it as qurbanat beravam. She repeats it 54 times in 15 letters. And she repeats, I love you, which is not very easy for Iranian men and women to say it on a regular basis. Even at our wedding, a woman is not allowed to say yes at the first asking, because that would, might be showing too much excitement. Um, for the wedding to come. So, I love you. I love your whole being. I love the gray hair on the nape of your back, on your, of your neck. <coughs> Excuse me. I love the wandering of your lazy eyes. I love your joy and sorrow. What are you? And why can't I find rest anywhere else other than in you? Even your footprints on the ground sustain me. They support me. They hold me up so that I can trust, so that I remain upright so I can be. It's enough that you call me and say Farooq and I'm born again. And the trees and the sun and the birds are reborn with me. Oh, I love you, I love you. My heart cannot endure all this love. My heart seems too big for my ribcage it draws me to a state of restlessness. And in another letter she writes, oh, I can't, I can't be without you. I don't want without you. I don't understand without you. I don't feel without you. I don't see without you. Without you, I lack the will to live. Oh, if you only knew, today, I felt so miserable that I brought all your papers out and read them again. I love your letters. I love the way your pen swirls across the pages. I look at the words and I remember the movement of your hands. Where are your hands? The hands that stroke my skin like the advent of waking. When I hold those hands, listen to that. When I hold those hands, I am free from the terror of being strung up in the middle of the earth and the sky. I love you, Shahi Jan. Shahi is Mr. Gulistan's uh, name. Um, everybody who knows him, it's his surname, calls him by that name. I love you, Shahi Jan. What's the use of writing this? How can I write this? When I think about you, it feels as if every beat is becoming a thousand times stronger and is being repeated a thousand times. My whole body is being torn apart. So I think these letters are as some of them at least sections of them, are as beautiful as some of her love poems. Um, and um, I'm very grateful for the chance to have them uh, and uh, to put it out there for scholars like me who've been interested in the life and in the work of this woman.
It will, those letters and the 15 other letters, there are more than uh, four letters, um, um, more than 15 letters. So let me just give you uh, a rundown of the letters I have been able to find so far. 55 letters of uh, Farooq have been published. They're all to uh, her husband, her, the only uh, husband she had, Mr. Parviz Shakur, a lovely man. Um, 13 are to Feridun Farrokhzad. And I have to say, none of these letters, except for perhaps one or two, have been published in their full. They're censored. There is a word deleted here, a paragraph deleted there, a sentence deleted there. I decided if and only when I can publish those letters uncensored, it's when I will publish them. And I have not touched a word. In fact, I will show you what we have done to uh, uh, be loyal to her. Um, so these are the letters that have been published to this day, as you see, it's uh, over 80, 83 uh, total numbers. And um, so in my book, you're going to see 30 books, uh, 30 letters. On every page, we have put the original letter, um, her handwriting. And because sometimes her handwriting is not very easy to read, uh, and because they sometimes needed um, um, major uh, research, especially for all, I think in the 15 letters to Mr. Golestan, there are references to 68, I think about 68 films in 15 letters. We have all these letters now, if you count all of them, it's about 120 letters from Farooq Farrakhzad. We rarely have any poems from people to Farooq Farrakhzad. And I assure you, I've been looking for them. If anyone told me I have a letter of Farooq, I traveled anywhere in the world to go to at least get a photocopy of that letter. Mitra Raksha, one of her closest friends, told me she had a letter. I went to Italy to pick up that letter. I would have done it. And I have asked people I knew, can you please give me a letter that someone wrote to Furu Farosad? There are a few, very few postal cards that I could find. And you see, this is not me cutting the name. Whoever was the author, has decided to cut the name. So we don't know who wrote, who wrote this letter, but you see it's almost like a sunflower. It's really beautiful. And it says just a couple of things about uh, the, uh, his trip. It's by a man. And then he repeats, I love you, Qurbanetu, Qurbanetu, 37 times in that postal card. Um, So I can stop this here, and you might need to help me with that. So I now want to move um, to um, the conversation about Farrokhzad's major themes. Uh, we know, of course, um, that um, one of the most important themes in Farrokhzad's uh, work um, is love, undoubtedly. Uh, it's talking about love differently uh, and from a woman's perspective. Uh, Shamlu, um, our major poet, uh, said something really interesting. Um, he said, when you read Farrell Sad's poetry, you don't need to see his, her signature you know these are poems written by a woman. Uh, the content of it, the form of it, the, everything about that poem will tell you this was written by a woman. Um, so um, another theme, of course, is femininity. Um, Farrakhzad, as she said it 
to Ibra uh, Iraji Golistan in one of the best interviews when Iraji, Mr. Gorgin, God bless him, asks her, says, I think one of the most important characteristics of your poetry is that it is feminine. It's written by a female poet. And the answer was very simple and very furuk like She said, if my poetry is like that of a woman, it's because I am a woman. Khoshbakhtane, man yek zana. Fortunately, I am a woman. And so, of course, I'm going to write like a woman. And she did. And we might think, what's so big about that? She was a woman, she was a writer, the pen was in her hand, she had publishers by now. What's so big about being a woman and writing as a woman? So my talk today, hopefully, will help clarify that. What was so unusual about writing as a woman and being a woman? So I have compared um, Farooq Farooqzad to the Iranian, um, I've called her the Iranian Icarus. Um, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with Icarus. Um, there's lots of paintings about him, lots of poems about him. Um, uh, Icarus um, was the son of Daedalus. Um, they are actually the father was uh, the best engineer architect. He is the first one who built a prison, a labyrinth of sort. That to me is like a prison because they wanted someone to, to get in there and never to be able to get out. But life is a game of boomerang. I say always, uh, I love cooking, I say, La life is a bowl of ash, of Persian soup. Mm -hmm. What you put in your pot, you will eventually get it in your bowl. Um, it's very simple and it, it happens. At least that's what I'm convinced of. So the first builder of a prison ended up a prisoner. And um, he was put in um, uh, a crate island with his son, uh, Icarus. Um, he was the best engineer. After a while, he knew he has to get out of that island. So he built four wings, two for himself and two for his sons. And he called his young son uh, a wonderful, uh, Baudelaire has written beautiful poems about him, many have, uh, an idealist, a risk taker, Someone who could have bold dreams. Some, someone who could dream with eyes wide open. And he glued them on to himself and he glued them on to Icarus. And he said, son, don't fly too high. You, when, when you get to the sun, the wax is going to melt and you're going to dive deep in the ocean and you'll be dead. And don't fly too low because the feathers on your wing will catch water. It will be heavy and it will draw you down. down. So take the middle course and you will be a free man. We'll get out of this island. Well, Daedalus was a wise man, but Icarus was a dreamer. He was a poet. He wanted to survive. And in fact, he has survived. His father, who took the prudent course, the middle course, was physically alive for a while. But he survives in the arts, in many museums, many poetry books. He always wanted to meet with the sun. And he said, I'm going to do it. 
So he did. He went to the sun. And of course, we know what happened to him. So he was a risk taker. So was Farooq Farrasad. And Farooq knew the consequences of her actions. And she still did it. The resemblance I see between the two is exactly that. Um, the character, the willingness, um, the boldness, the audacity to take risks. And in many of her writings, in many of the interviews, in some of her letters, and in many of her short stories, she says over and over again that I knew I shouldn't do that, but I wanted to do it, and I did it. And we know she paid an exorbitant price for it. So Farouk Zad, um, we talked yesterday about how um, the image of the sun is central to her poetry. Um, even in the first poetry collection, in Captive, there are 10 references to the sun and her desire to fly. You know, we can take flying metaphorically, we can take it physically, uh, we can take it literally, we can take it literarily. And I want to do that today, hopefully combining all of them together. I had a few poems about her love of the sun, of light, um, but I don't think I will have time. Um, so with your permission, I'm not going to do those uh, lines. And I'm going to go to um, the theme that I want to um, focus uh, more uh, today than anything else. There are two major themes that is central to Farouk Zod's five poetry collections, her short stories, and even her film. And next uh, session, we are going to first see the film. I don't know how many of you have seen The House is Black. So uh, we're going to see it again, and we're going to discuss it as an ideal life narrative, as, as a manifesto also of Farooq's uh, art and life. Um, um, so the two central themes, other than the ones I've said, love, uh, in Farooq's poetry is the theme of captivity and flight. If we focus on either of these two, if we only focus on her desire to fly to the gateless sky, and you know, she loved the sky because there are no walls up there. You know, it's gateless, it, it's free. She could go anywhere she wanted. She, flying for her had also a metaphoric meaning. But flight is only part of the story. There is also another story. It's the story of Farouzad's captivity. And that happens from the first poem she wrote, from the few first poems she wrote, she wrote to the very end. So basically saying, um, um, don't uh, lock my lips. I have an untold story. You know, she's been telling us about that story from the early poems. And open from my feet the chain that is restraining me that is holding me in place. So um, the first poetry collection is called Asir, captive, a prisoner. The second wall is called walls, restriction, obstacles, not being able to have a gateless free space, rebellion. 
And then, of course, after that, you have Tavalodi Digar, Born Again. So there is a lot of poetry, uh, a lot of poem um, um, in Farrokhzad about these two. Um, <coughs> imagine how important that is in our Persian culture. Can you imagine Rostam, uh, the hero of um, our national epic, the Book of Kings, without Rakhsh? Can you think of the life of Sadi without all his travels? Can you think about Shams and Rumi without their dances, whirling derv dervishes? My examples can go on and on. A synonym for mad in Persian is marde meydan. Men belong to the public square. And where was the place of a woman? Traditionally, zane khani. House was the place of a woman. For centuries, sex segregation divided the world of men and women in Iran and in many other Islamic countries. Our focus tonight is on Iran. The ideal woman, and I'm not saying all women could or would do it, but the ideal woman in Iran is Zana of Tab Mahtab Nadide, a woman not glimpsed by the sun or the moon, so covered, so restricted in her movement that she had not to be even seen by the sun and the moon. Zane sangino somet. Have you ever thought about the meaning of these terms? Somet. Lal. Not saying a word and sanguine, so heavy, not able to move around, to, to run around, to go places. Um, gender apartheid has been a part of our culture for years, for centuries. I, I would argue one of the central theme of the Islamic Republic of the, was to return women inside the house, to bedrooms and kitchens where they belonged. But I want to take just a few minutes to, to tell you that this... By 12 minutes? Five minutes? By 12 minutes. No, 12. 12. Okay. 12. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I will be... I'll finish. I'll try. Um, first, I want to tell you the importance of freedom of movement. If you're not free to move about, to leave <coughs> your indicated domain and to come back to it without penalty, without chaperones, you won't have access to higher education. You won't have access to power. Uh, you don't have access to political presentation, and we know how important that is. You don't have the right to exercise your economic rights. In the arts, we should ask ourselves, why is it that in a thousand years of Persian literature, we have so few women writers, and all of them, the overwhelming majority of them, up to a few decades ago, all poets. In a book about Iranian women writers, um, there are 294 writers. All 294 are poets. Uh, we know why. The answer is simple. Poetry is at the threshold of public and private art. All you need is a pen and a piece of paper to write it. And it doesn't demand 
long stretches of time. Anyway, the labor force, even exercising your religion. Those who decide the rules of the religion will, will be those who have freedom of movement and, of course, leisure. Um, so um, that's how important it is. And I want to give you one example of how women have been deprived of this freedom of movement, which is at the core of freedom of expression, freedom to have money, freedom to be politically involved. I'm going to focus on one example, on the issue of feminine beauty. You know, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? And look at that, the symbol of femininity and masculinity. Look at the woman. She's held in place, can't move, and it's a handheld mirror. And look at the man, the weapons of Mars. The sky is the limit. It's not attached. Look at this one. Attached here, stuck to the ground. Who is the counter ideal woman? Not only in our country, in most of the world. A witch. She has many qualities that, um, you know, old and wrinkled and asymmetrical with big feet. But also, she's flying around. And she's flying around on a broomstick, taking the very sign and symbol of domesticity and turning it into a vehicle able to carry them to anywhere she wants. This is the counter idea of women. What about foot binding, practiced for thousand years in China? What did foot binding do? Look at what it does to the foot of a woman. And then the idealization of this tiny little foot, it literally breaks the bones of these young girls. And it makes high heels out of the bones and the muscles of a woman. This mutilated feet is then considered the ideal of beauty. For a thousand years, you know, I teach a course called From Cinderella to Barbie, and we work a lot on a uh, few weeks on um, foot binding. There are so many books written about it, fabulous books. Um, you know, beauty context in China were based on these feet. Women will sit behind curtains and they will put their small tiny feet, not like that, but with their beautiful uh, slippers. Uh, and based on those, the most beautiful girl will be chosen in China. And now that, that, would it surprise you then if I tell you the oldest written version of Cinderella, whose characteristic feature were her tiny little feet, comes from China, congruent with the beginning of foot binding. Barbie, the icon of Western beauty, her feet, I did the calculation, her feet are the size of a woman, of a young girl of between four and five. <laughs> and, um, and to go back to literature, the erotics of immobility. Uh, world literature is filled with examples of women who are asleep, short of death, it's the best thing you can get, right? They're asleep, they're not moving, they're not talking. Sanguino summit, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> With modernity, something happened. You know, the oldest novel, according to many critics, is of course Don Quixote. 
And uh, what did Don Quixote do, among many things? Don Quixote acknowledged his desire to be free. You know, with his uh, sidekick, Sancho Panza, and his little donkey, he decided to go. He left the village not for war, not for money, not for in search of women. It was for no basic other reason other than his freedom of movement. And I think one of the most uh, powerful arguments made for prison is by, of course, Michel Foucault in Discipline and Punish. I would just, um, to me, I love this book. Um, I think um, women have had that experience. He argues that prison uh, started with modernity on a large scale because freedom of movement was so central to the modern citizen, uh, which that part is definitely true. Uh, then, of course, uh, and these days, as I was preparing my um, PowerPoint for the talk, uh, I couldn't help be reminded of what the Supreme Leader has said recently about bicycling of women. When, you know, he said that it was uh, causing promiscuity and therefore it's forbidden. When, when bicycles started, uh, um, women loved it. Uh, because they knew it's a means of transportation. It's giving them phys physical mobility. Susan B. Anthony, one of the leaders of women's movement uh, in the US, look at what she said. The bicycle has done more for the emancipation of women than anything else in the world. Um, and I couldn't resist showing that uh, at Oxford. Uh, when women were uh, uh, admitted for the first time, um, they protested, men protested. And what did they do? They burned the effigy of a woman on a bicycle. Um, you know, um, that tells you how important freedom of movement is. We've talked about money. We've talked about all sorts of um, restriction placed on women. Personally, I think the core basis of all of this is denying women their freedom of movement. And Farouk Farouk like no other poet, because men never experience that, so you don't expect them to write about it. I don't think anyone in Iran has focused more on the issue of freedom of movement than Farooq Afar um, You know, she's one of the first women who we talked about the trip. Um, I'll be done in a couple of minutes. Um, this is, uh, we talked about Behjat Asad. This is Behjat Asad. And I have another lovely picture of uh, uh, Farooq. This is when she was, uh, um, out of the hospital, uh, out of one of her suicide attempts, and um, in Italy with her friend Bejate Sad. Um, they were in Rome, and I, I went there to, anyway, it's. Uh, um, so, Farouk, um, this is Farouk, uh, I think, on snow. I was going to end today's talk because we might not be able to talk about it anymore uh, in the next two talks about um, her death. Um, you know that she uh, did predict uh, with uncanny precision uh, her death. And, um, she's buried in Zahira Dole. Uh, um, cemetery, um, and um, she was buried uh, under uh, falling snow. Uh, so this poem, published while she was alive, not after she was dead, says, perhaps the truth 
was those two hands, those two hands, those two young hands buried beneath the falling snow. And next year, when spring mates with the sky beyond the window, and cascades of saplings will erupt from her body, she will blossom, oh my love. She will blossom. And indeed, even after her death, Farooq continues to run. Uh, my, my dear friend, from whom I have learned a lot about everything, in particular about Farooq Farooqzad, Simin Behbahani, who was a friend of Furu Farrakhzad for a while, um, told me something that I will never forget. Um, she said one reason our friendship came to an end was a variety of reasons, but one major reason was jealousy between us. We, we were both competing with each other. And she said after um, Farooq passed away, I couldn't write for a while. And then one day I said to myself, look, Farooq is running even after her death. You need to run too. So Farooq continues to run after her death. I think every new reading of her poetry um, is a new revival of her legacy is a new understanding to this multifaceted, complex work. Um, and um, that if we believe in certain things, that when Gloria Farrokhzad, uh, Farrokh's sister, showed me uh, this uh, uh, identity card, I really had goosebumps all over me. So you see, um, so the first one is her identity. Uh, when she was born, the father, the mother, the rest of it. At the second page, every time a woman uh, or a man, anyone is buried, they cancel it. They have to, to allow the burial. Look at it. It has not been canceled. I don't think Furu Farrakhzad will die. She, she will be with us. And here's one indication of it. And last but not least, we talked yesterday a little bit about um, the bipolar nature of her poetry, the high and the low, uh, the joy and the despair. But if you take the whole world, work of Farooq Farrakhzad as a whole. I think it's exactly like the sky, like a rainbow in the sky. We only see the rainbow when there is sun and the rain. Two opposite things that are considered to be an either-or dichotomy. It's either the rain or it's either the sun. Come together and in a moment of magic and mystery, create this caravan of colors. I think the poetry of Furu Farrakhzad does that for us, creates this nuanced caravan of feelings and candor and decency and sheer aesthetic beauty. Thank you for listening.